In the previous lecture, we looked at characterizing scalar random quantities, and the goal is to ultimately characterize signals so that we can describe or represent the uncertainty that's inherent with various aspects of the signal. Well, in general, it's desirable to represent more degrees of freedom than just a scalar, so we're going to look at characterizing signals in terms of multiple random quantities. So we'll begin with using a vector, and a vector is a collection of capital N scalars. The symbol for a vector, when I write it out, will be a lowercase symbol with an underscore or a line under it, and I'm generally going to assume that vectors are column vectors. So I've written this as a row to save space, and then we've taken the transpose here so that this vector x is an n by 1 vector. Now these entries here, these scalars, could be a lot of different things. We might have these be samples of a time signal taken at different instants in time, or these could be samples from different sensors, such as different microphones recording in a room, or different antennas recording electromagnetic signals. So this is a general way of describing a collection of n random quantities or random variables. Now just as in the scalar case, vectors also have a PDF, probability density function, so we'll write that as f of the vector x, and this probability density function not only characterizes the random behavior of each of the entries of the vector, but it also characterizes the relationships between all the entries in the vector. We can think of having a collection of random vectors, and the PDF tells us how that collection is distributed if we were to reach in this bin and pull one out. I've drawn a two-dimensional example here where I have a vector with capital N equal to 2. So the probability density function is basically the height above the plane for different combinations of x1 and x2. And we'll develop a little more insight on that as we go along. Perhaps the most widely used multivariate probability density function is the multivariate Gaussian. The probability density function can be expressed as I've shown. We have so a scale factor up front, and then this is the determinant of R, which is the n by n covariance matrix of the vector, to the minus one half power times exponent negative one half, and then we have x minus the mean transpose times the inverse of the covariance matrix times x minus the mean. So this is a row vector times a matrix times a column vector, and that gives us a scalar in the exponent. M is the mean, of course that has n elements, one for each of the elements in the original vector, and this symbol here, superscript with a minus one, denotes matrix inverse. And as we said with the scalar case, we don't always need or want to work with the full probability density function. Oftentimes just looking at the mean and the covariance matrix are sufficient. Now in this case, the mean and the covariance matrix completely define the density, but if we have data that's not multivariate Gaussian, we can use the mean and the covariance matrix to characterize those in a partial way. Now the mean is the expected value of the vector x, so the ith element of the mean, which is an n by 1 vector, is going to be the expected value of x sub i, so that's the mean of the appropriate entry in x, and the covariance matrix is defined as the expectation of the data minus the mean times the data minus the mean transpose. So I have column vector times a row vector, and that's where I get the n by n dimensional matrix. Now the covariance matrix describes the linkage or the relationship between different random variables, so xi and xj for example. Now we're going to introduce a symbol lowercase r sub ij, and that'll be the shorthand for the ij element of the matrix r. And if we look at the matrix r, the ij element is just the expected value of xi minus mi times xj minus mj. So this is telling us on average how xi and xj vary together, or co-vary, about the mean. And we have several cases that we're going to consider. Let's begin with i being equal to j, so rii, in other words, the ith diagonal element of the matrix R. And in this case, we have the expected value of xi minus mi squared, and that's just the variance of xi. So along the diagonal of the matrix R, 
we have the variance of the corresponding random variables. Now when i is not equal to j, then we learn about the relationship between xi and xj. So let's suppose, first of all, that rij is a positive number. Well, what that means, if this quantity, the average value of xi minus mi times xj minus mj is positive, then on average, xi minus mi and xj minus mj have the same sign. They're either both positive or they're both negative on average. And that tells us that relative to their means, xi and xj tend to rise and fall together. Maybe simpler to think about assuming the mean is equal to zero. And in that case, what we would have is that if xi tended to increase, xj would also tend to increase. Whereas if xi was decreasing, we'd conclude that xj also was a negative number because they need to on average have the same sign. Same argument, if rij is less than zero, then on average, the deviation of the random variable from the mean for xi and xj, they have opposite signs. We're gonna get this average product is negative, so that means the signs have to be opposite. And that tells us that xi and xj tend to move in opposite directions. In other words, when xi is positive relative to its mean, it's bigger than its mean, xj tends to be smaller than its mean, and vice versa. Now the final case is when rij is equal to zero. And what this tells us is that on average, again, thinking of the expectation as an average, on average, there's no consistent relationship between the sign of xi relative to its mean and xj relative to its mean. We would say that xi and xj are uncorrelated. Now, it turns out that as the magnitude of rij increases, the degree of coupling between xi and xj increases. Now, it turns out there's something that often is, comes up in statistics community called the correlation coefficient. And the correlation coefficient is related to these off-diagonal elements of the covariance matrix by normalizing Rij by the respective standard deviations for Xi and Xj. So Rii is the variance of Xi, so Rii to the one-half is a standard deviation. Rjj to the one-half is a standard deviation of Xj. Normalizing in this way, we get a correlation coefficient that ranges between minus 1 and plus 1 because there's this fundamental bound that the magnitude of Rij has to be less than or equal to the product of Rii and Rjj to the one-half. In signal processing, we'll often use the term correlation we describe relationships between two random variables, and oftentimes we're referring to Rij, not necessarily to this normalized correlation coefficient. Now here we have some examples, and what I did was generate a thousand random vectors. They're two-dimensional, so I have the x1 direction on the horizontal axis, the x2 value on the vertical axis, and I've plotted a plus sign for each of the thousand samples that I collected. So you can think of this, I'm running an experiment, I'm reaching my hand into this bin containing two-dimensional vectors, and I do that a thousand times and pull it out. And in this particular case, these random vectors were multivariable Gaussian distributed. I chose a mean of one and two. So x1 is a mean of one, x2 is a mean of two. And you can see those marked on the respective axes here. And for this one on the left, I've assumed that the covariance matrix R is diagonal. So this means that both x1 and x2 have unit variance and they're uncorrelated because R12 is equal to zero. So I should see no consistent relationship between the sign of x1 relative to m1 and that of x2 relative to m2. And we get some sort of approximately uniformly scattered collection of data points here. So here in the middle, I've got the same mean, one for m1 and two for the, the second component, x2. And I've chosen a covariance matrix that again has ones on the diagonal so x1 and x2 are both unit variance random variables, but now I've introduced the correlation between them. R12 is 0.8, so that's greater than zero. And we would expect that when x1 is positive with respect to its mean, 
we should see x2 also positive with respect to its mean. And that's indeed what we get here. We get a cluster of points that extends to the positive positive direction relative to the mean and the negative negative direction because, of course, the signs can also both be negative. Now, the third example we have here on the right is showing when the correlation coefficient is negative. So everything else is the same. It's just now I've used negative 0.8 for the correlation between x1 and x2 in the covariance matrix. And you see that, indeed, when x1 tends to be positive, that's this side, relative to its mean, x2 tends to be negative relative to its mean. And on the other hand, when x1 is negative relative to its mean, x2 tends to be positive relative to its mean. So this is a negative correlation, and we see cluster of points has rotated 90 degrees from what we had with the positive correlation, where things were going from negative negative to positive positive. Here we have negative positive to positive negative. Now, as I said a moment ago, the multivariate Gaussian is completely described by the mean and covariance. So if I understand the mean and the covariance matrix, or if I have access to those, then I have a complete description for the signal. In general, it's useful, even for signals that are not multivariate Gaussian, to describe them with the mean and covariance, because that describes some basic properties. And this notion of correlation being reflected in the off-diagonal elements of the covariance matrix applies whether it's Gaussian or not. And we're going to conclude looking at the geometry of the multivariate Gaussian. And what I mean by geometry is looking at the so-called level curves or the sets of vectors x for which the probability density is constant. And if I think of this probability density function as some sort of a mountain, then what these level curves represent are the contour lines or the lines of constant elevation above the x1, x2 plane. If you look at the density for the multivariate Gaussian, there's some stuff out front, but the part that depends on x is in the exponent. And we see that if f of x is going to be constant, that implies that I have x minus m transpose r inverse x minus m is equal to a constant c. Now this description here, x minus m transpose r inverse x minus m equals c, actually describes an ellipse when n equals 2. And when n is greater than 2, we talk about this being an ellipsoid. And what we have is the probability density is going to be centered at x equals m. That'll be the, the peak value, because then the exponent takes its minimum. Remember, it's exponent negative 1 half times this. So when this goes to 0, when, which happens when x is equal to m, the exponent attains its largest value. So that'll be the peak of the density is located at m. And then in terms of this ellipse, it turns out that the major axis is the direction of the eigenvector of r for the largest eigenvalue. And it has length 2 times the square root of c times lambda max, where that's the eigenvalue. So we're interested in the covariance matrix R here and its eigenstructure. That tells us both the major axis and the minor axis. And the minor axis is in the direction of the eigenvector associated with the smallest eigenvalue of R. And the length of the minor axis is 2 times the square root of whatever value of constant we choose here times lambda min. Of course, different values for C will give us different heights above the surface. The larger C gets, the closer, the lower the value of f of x, because again, this is an exponent with a negative sign times this. So we can sketch this for one of the examples that we did on the previous slide. Uh, if I have a mean at 1 and 2, then in the x1, x2 plane, the peak value of f of x will be at location m, which is 1, 2. And if I take the case where I had the negative correlation between x1 and x2, if we take the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix, we see that the largest eigenvalue is 1.8 and the largest eigenvector is in the minus 1, 1 direction. So that is in, if I go from m in the minus for x1 and the plus for x2, um, and this is going to be at you know 135 degrees because these both have the same magnitude. So that's the direction of the major axis. 
And then the minor axis, we see that we have the smallest eigenvalue of 0.2, and the minor axis has direction minus 1, minus 1. So that's in the negative, negative direction. So this is the minor axis. Now, if this is a level curve or a constant elevation for f of x, what I should have is that the length in the major axis is 2 times the square root of c lambda max, while the minor axis is 2 times c lambda min. And since lambda 1 is 1.8 and lambda 2 is 0.2, the ratio of these is going to be like the square root of 9 or a factor of 3 in this particular case. But in general, we get this geometry where we have these ellipsoidal contours, and the covariance matrix tells us the shape of those contours. And it's very similar to the scatter plot that we looked at on the previous slide. You can see that these scatter plots have roughly ellipsoidal shapes. If I took a lot more points, we'd see that more clearly. And again, the direction of the major and minor axes are consistent with the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, and the lengths of those major and minor axes are consistent with the eigenvalues. So the covariance matrix is a very powerful description for the relationships between random variables. And vectors can be used to describe quite general types of signals, be they multiple samples in time of a given signal, or whether they're the outputs of, say, different sensors, like an antenna or a microphone, at the same instant in time. By knowing the covariance matrix and the mean, we can characterize the behavior of the random vector.